Hey, this is Pastor Curry, pastor of the Easy and Fair Baptist Church, woman to his most exciting church, the church that love ya and anything you could do about it. Today with Coffee with Curry, we're ending our month long celebration of women's history. Women have played such an integral role in the community and serving and doing what they had to do in order to help our community survive. And what I wanted to do today is I wanted to just take a trip down the road and see various women who contributed some, some various um, um, speeches and, and monologues that will help us to get a better appreciation of what I would call women's history because they play such a significant role. So I want you to call somebody real quickly. Tell them Coffee with Curry is on and let's get after it. back. The first thing we would like to do is we just want to do a monologue on some sharing where the suffrage of women in America, uh, well, whether you want to believe it or not, but women have never been treated fairly or equal. But we want to make sure that as we celebrate this month, that we begin to be cognizant of the fact that we need to treat women as equals, not as less thans. Let's take a listen to what is being shared. Revolution takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but sometimes it does. But even when it seems to come out of nowhere, it's often 30 years worth of wishing for it. cannot be a revolutionary without strong feelings of love, right? Those of us who dare to walk this walk do that because we, lo we love our people and we love humanity in a way that we believe that the earth and humanity deserves better. We believe our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren deserve better. And if you want it, you have to be willing to fight for it. Why are you so angry? Aren't you tired of being angry? Aren't you so exhausted? Like, yeah, this is exactly why I'm angry, because I'm exhausted, you know? I'm angry at how the world sees us. I'm angry at how the world treats us. I'm angry at the positions that I was forced to be in to survive. I'm angry that I have to survive rather than live. I'm angry that there's people who look like me who aren't allowed to be themselves. There are people who look like me who are being killed and kidnapped and raped every day. And I, I'm angry that no one else is as angry as I am. There is no age requirement to change the world. That young people, through small acts of rebellion, through small acts of kindness, can also force us all to look at the world a little bit differently. Young people have always been at the forefront of change, right? They haven't always had the money, the power, or the title, but they have used their voice and oftentimes their bodies and oftentimes given up their life to be able to advocate for things that are bigger than themselves, trying to make it better for all of us. When we hear about colonization, when we hear about gentrification, when we hear about complying, when we hear about systematic structures and oppression, it just shows that we can resist. It's important to know that we are strong and we can control our narrative because we've done so in the past and we can do it again. I have to look in different parts of the world in order to understand the interconnectedness of our struggle and the need for interconnectedness in our resistance. Radical politics, radical resistance, radical struggle, they're all born out of revolutionary love. You have to have a profound love for the people. And that love has to trump professional gain. It has to trump social networking. It has to trump money. What I've witnessed in this story that's happening as we speak is that there are always people who saw it coming in their dreams and don't get to see it happen in their lives. I'm talking about the continuum of our ancestors that resisted as soon as they got off the boats. All of those ancestors want to see us in a place that we have never been, or certainly in a place that would never allow us to be where they had to go through, right? So 
They never gave up. How could we give up? How dare us give up? We survived a major, colossal genocide because they never gave up, because they faced those consequences. And I dare say that the survival of our people merits us having that kind of courage and be willing to face those consequences. You have to be able to imagine what freedom looks like in spite of the conditions in which you may have been raised in and brought up in. And it becomes very important to imagine, to have this imagination in these moments when there's doubt, in these moments when there's death. You have to imagine that these things that you're fighting for, you may not see the benefits of them in your lifetime, but there will be people who come after you who will benefit from these things. People whose names you don't know, people who you will never meet, but they will inherit a world that is vastly better than the one that you were in because of the necessity of revolt. If you do the work of the Black radical tradition in any form or fashion, you're going to be compromising and sacrificing something. The stuff that the world dangles in front of you to tempt you away from being radical, to tempt you away from challenging power. So yeah, if you follow these traditions, yeah, you might lose a job. You might lose some friends, you might lose some money. But history will vindicate you. Our people will thank you, ultimately and the ancestors will smile on you. is in our love and tears, our fears and our flyness. I do my hair toss, check my nails. Baby, how you feel? Woo, child, tired of the foolish, gone, dust your shoulders off. Keep it moving, yeah, slow. Step into some new yeah. kicks. In there, swimwear, going to the pool quick. Come now, come dry your eyes. You know you a star, you can touch the sky. I know that it's hard, but you have to try. If you need advice, yeah. let me simplify. You must never be defeated, ever. I do my hair, talk, check my nails. Baby, how you I am black and proud. The future belongs to all of us. Baby, how you feeling? I hope that you enjoyed uh, that segment. This next segment that we are going to enter into is really to speak to women as a whole, not just African-American women, but women across the world. They have paved the road for us to be who we are as citizens in America. Even during the times of war, it was women who made sure they took care of the various things in order to keep us healthy, to keep us sound. So I hope that you will enjoy this trip down memory lane as we look at some of the significant women who played a very, very integral role in the formation of America's history. They have been called such names as freedom fighters. The first lady of civil rights. And mother. But never have they been called complacent. Dolores Huerta, Rosa Parks, and Frances Grice. Women whose actions change life not just locally, but on a national level by setting a precedent for others. I'm Jessica Greenwell with Iris Hill. Today we feature three individuals who fought tirelessly for the rights of others as feminists, catalysts, and activists. Welcome to Civil Women. Few have contributed as much to the advancement of oppressed groups as Presidential Medal of Freedom winner, Dolores Huerta. Huerta was born on April 10, 1930. 
Raised by a single mother who overcame the odds by opening a large hotel providing shelter to low-wage workers, she spent her childhood in the highly diverse community of Stockton, California. After starting a career as a teacher, Huerta saw the misery of students living in poverty and felt called to a life of fighting injustice. With the legendary Cesar Chavez, she founded the National Farm Workers Association, but that was just the start of her accomplishments. She went on to successfully lobby for unprecedented gains for farm workers, including disability insurance and the right to unionize. As revolutionary as her work for agricultural laborers was, her fights for women were no less significant. Often partnering with feminist icon Gloria Steinem, Huerta traveled across the country on behalf of the feminist majority, encouraging women to run for office and leading to significantly more female representation at every level of government. She remains a social justice warrior, and we at the Empire Network PBS were honored to interview her during Women's History Month. Who's got the power? We have the power! They've got the highest number of women ever that are now running for political office at all different types of levels. And uh, I do believe that we have a political reawakening that is happening in the United States right now. Dolores Huerta is a living legend. We had a packed auditorium here at Valley College listening to her, and she got everybody on their feet, everybody wanting to uh, work together toward a better world, and everybody saying, yes we can, yes we can. She's still so relevant and so current because there's so many concerns that we have today in the world. I hope that the Me Too movement is just the beginning. Um, it, it's not just about sexual harassment, it's about equal pay for women, it's about equal service for women. And so you say, well, what is a feminist? Well, a feminist is number one, somebody who stands up for women's re reproductive rights, stand up for gay rights, stand up for immigrants, stand up for labor unions, uh, stand up for our environment, right? This is what a feminist is, and so the men can also be feminists. I hope that a lot of students here at Valley and, and throughout the area will be inspired by her to see what they can do in their lives if they just pay attention to what she's done and if they keep the persistence that Dolores has demonstrated now for so, so many decades. I think sometimes uh, people think that movements just happen. And maybe in today's uh, world, uh, with the internet and with devices that you can bring people together fast, as we have seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the Me Too movement, with the DACA students, that you, you can get information out there and people are kind of on the same uh, wavelengths, you, you might say. Uh, but in order for movements to be sustainable, I think you've got to build organization. And when you think about the United Farm Workers, we actually organized for three years before the strike. So when the farm workers came out on strike, it wasn't spontaneous, like, you know, Caesar walked through the field and the workers came out on strike. No, we organized workers in their homes, having house meetings with them. And so many of the workers that came out on strike, and especially the leadership, they were already organized. They knew what we were about. When we talk about working people, you know, we have to talk about labor unions. And you hear the news media, and you hear these corporations, and they talk about, well, labor unions, they call it big labor, is a special interest. How can you be a special interest when the majority of the people in the United States are working people? So the strike didn't end up with just, say, getting an increase in wages. Uh, farm workers were then uh, getting only like 50 cents an hour. We went for collective bargaining for the right to organize. And so that was much more permanent than just getting a little wage increase. It was, you know, we had to have a contract uh, with uh, conditions in the contract that if workers were fired, uh, we could take the employers to, to court, to arbitration, uh, to get them back their jobs and, and get, to be able to get a medical plan for them and a pension plan for them. So it was not just about the wages, but getting the benefits and getting representation on the workforce, in the workplace. The farm workers union developed and the two people who founded it were Cesar Chavez, whom almost everybody knows, and Dolores Huerta who was fully equal in organizing and creating the union. But Dolores never really was, was recognized as much. And many students today don't even know who she is. She's an extraordinary individual. 
who has always been trying to bring young people into positions of responsibility and influence. I think we do have a solution uh, to the issues that we're facing, and that is our educational system. Because we have the structure, but we just have to change the content of what we teach. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said uh, when uh, during World War II, we will not take one dime out of our schools or one dime out of our libraries because education is the foundation of our democracy. I do believe that the reason racism exists in our country and misogyny and homophobia and bigotry, uh, lack of science, is because in our educational systems, from the time that our children are in kindergarten, we do not teach what the contributions have been of people of color. Uh, Native Americans who were the first slaves, whose land we sit on, that we never thanked them or compensated them for the land. The African slaves that built the White House and the Congress, that isn't in our school books, right? The Mexicans that came in here and not only, you know, tilled our fields, built our railroads, the Chinese, the Japanese, Filipinos, people from India that were brought in to build the infrastructure of our United States of America. And we have to teach that in our school books. If not, we're never gonna end the racism and our children of color will never get the dignity that they deserve for what their people did to build the country. And our Anglo children, we can prevent them from having the poison of white supremacy and white privilege. We can make that happen, but it's gotta be done through education. I think ultimately it's the whole community's responsibility to make sure that people of color are um, educated about their history and about what's possible. And teachers at every level, from the kindergarten, the pre-K, all the way up to the professors in the highest you can go, educate yourself about the people that you're, you're, you're gonna be teaching. I think that's the respectful thing to do. Yeah. My students. <laughs> professors can motivate students, they can encourage students to get involved, and, 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 and aside from doing a good job and writing papers, how are you going to really be able to uh, implement or put it into practice? You know, being able to see the contributions that people of color has made to America and to the world, um, you know, that changes the game for a young person because if you're not talking about me, then, you know, I'm, I'm tuning out. You know, like you want me to be something great, then you have to show me something great watch a woman like her just rise to the notoriety that she has and work so hard for other people is like I wanted to be that even though I was an immigrant and um, she gave me hope that despite my immigration status that there were things that I could do for other people that would make me and a um, little piece of my world a better place. Student involvement, community involvement is crucial, it's absolutely key. Uh, we are the majority but if people stay home and they don't vote, then we lose. We've got to be politically savvy. When I saw the movie Dolores, I kind of reflected back on my own life. And there's one scene in the movie uh, where they show uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, Larry E. Leong, and then uh, all these men, and they're signing the contracts that we finally won after this big, huge boycott when we got 17 million Americans to stop eating grapes. I'm not in that picture. Now, I did the boycott, OK? I negotiated the contracts with all these growers, but I'm not in the picture. I'll tell you why. Because when we were sitting down, after getting ready to sign those contracts, uh, Brother Larry E. Leong came up to me. He said, Dolores, do you mind if I uh, have your seat? I was sitting next to Caesar. And I said, oh, of course, Larry. And I, walked, I got up and walked away. Women, don't ever do that. <laughs> I just appreciate the candor that she brings um, to the female perspective, especially as a woman of color, because it's not always heard in the media and definitely not in the public. Women are sorely needed uh, in our society, and not just as uh, mothers and wives and sisters, but we need women as leaders, because we as women, we have a different intuition, we think differently, and if there's somewhere that you feel that you should be, you put yourself there. Because remember this, a woman's place is not only where she wants to be, but a woman's place is where she needs to be. And if somehow you're not in that space, 
where your voice is needed, you step into that space. You don't have to wait to be invited. A woman who didn't wait for an invitation to change history was Rosa Parks. Parks has been revered as one of the most influential people of the 20th century. She was born in my home state of Alabama in 1913. Exposed to segregation at an early age, Rosa walked to elementary school since black children were not allowed on the bus. At 19, she met Raymond Parks, a member of the Montgomery NAACP. The two were married and she joined the organization as a youth leader and a secretary. On December 1st, 1955, after her shift as a seamstress in a store, Parks refused to obey the bus driver's order to relinquish her seat in the colored section to a white passenger. Following her arrest, Parks called NAACP President Edie Nixon. Within hours, the Women's Political Council, a group created to address issues for black bus patrons, took charge. Black community leaders organized a nonviolent bus boycott that lasted 381 days. A young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was appointed spokesperson, and the boycott continued for more than a year. In June, the federal district court ruled that the city's segregation policies were unconstitutional, and that was upheld by the Supreme Court in November. Montgomery announced its compliance the next month, a year after the protests began. Although Rosa Parks wasn't the first black person to refuse giving up a seat, her quiet bravery inspired a unified front and played a pivotal role in the freedom movement. She received numerous honors, including the Medal of Freedom, like Dolores Huerta, and the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. Parks passed away at the age of 92 in 2005. On February 27, 2013, Congress dedicated a statue to Rosa Parks in the United States Capitol, approximately 100 years after her birth. And that is why this statue belongs in this hall. And she has other such tributes around the country, but the newest was unveiled in San Bernardino, California during February of 2018. What a beautiful day to commemorate the unveiling of the Rosa Parks statue here in downtown San Bernardino. I think what's important to remember is that just as Rosa Parks was a symbol of resistance, she was a symbol of courage, symbol of perseverance, San Bernardino has been through a whole lot. And San Bernardino is the picture of resistance and perseverance and courage. And I, I would love for that always to be something that we look at. San Bernardino stands strong, but before San Bernardino stood strong, Rosa Parks sat strong. Calling on our mother Rosa, could she speak to us of courage and equality? Would we be so moved as to move she? Would we? Can we try that right now? Let's all stand up. Some of us are on our feet. Some of us are in our chair. If you can stand, stand. Let's sing together, We Shall Overcome. Let's see if we can call on our mother Rosa. You remember. You've seen the movie. Arms intertwined and a lock through the elbow and a sway. Come on, sway for Mother Rosa. We shall overcome. Come on now. We shall overcome. One of the things that I learned was that she really fought for human rights. And to see a lot of people coming together, doesn't matter what the race, to celebrate her, it really proves how much she has unified the nation just in her spirit alone. Everyone just loved her, and I understand why. I think that when we study the history of Rosa Parks, there's so much. The fact that she, she is part Native American is extremely important. The fact that she is a woman is extremely important. The fact that she was from Alabama is extremely important. All of these factors, each one of us is going to take a part of that and we'll identify with that. And here was a hero, a shero, who stood up for something that was so important. And what she fought for wasn't just for the African American, it was for all of us, quite frankly. And it's something that we all, it's something that we all need to live up to. But you know, Rosa Parks was uh, not just by herself. The whole uh, boycott that she participated in was a plan. And they had made this plan at the Highlands uh, Center in Tennessee. So they already knew what they were going to do because that was, uh, you know, that, that was a strategic 
plan that they made ahead of time. some uh, an icon like Rosa Parks. What I was thinking when I sculpted it is that she's a hero, a heroine, I guess, and that uh, that's what the world needs is more people who lead by example. And hopefully that that's what they can take away from is that they can uh, go out and do good deeds amongst the community. It's kind of bittersweet because uh, my mother passed away and she modeled for the statue. She sat in my studio and we talked about uh, civil rights movement and what she was doing about that time and the glasses that are on Rosa Parks were my mother's. They were um, molded and bronzed. As society starts to get farther and farther away from the civil rights movement, they tend to forget the importance of it, especially now with the importance of making sure that everyone is treated the way that they should be treated. And when you look at a statue of Rosa Parks, it brings back everything that she stood for and everything that we should stand for and continue to fight for. Parks' singular act of disobedience launched a movement. The tired feet of those who walked the dusty roads of Montgomery helped a nation see that to which it had once been blind. We shall overcome the Rosa Parks said in her autobiography, My Story, that it isn't true she gave up her seat because of being tired at the end of a workday. What was the real story? She was tired of giving in. Parks lost her job during the bus boycott and had a challenging time finding work. In 1957, Rosa Parks and her husband moved to Detroit, Michigan, where she served on the staff of U.S. Representative John Conyers. A few years later, a future civil rights icon would move from that very city in 1962 to make her mark in San Bernardino, California, which is also home to the Empire Network PBS. Frances Grice discovered that San Bernardino schools were segregated by race and not equal. In response, she helped co-found the Community League of Mothers, a grassroots coalition that spoke for African Americans and fought to end that policy in San Bernardino schools. With the help of the NAACP, in 1973, the California Supreme Court ruled that the school district was guilty of discrimination, thereby ending segregation in San Bernardino schools. Grice also founded Operation Second Chance, a technical school that trained thousands of low-income youth, welfare recipients, and workers displaced by plant closure. She was bestowed numerous honors, including the presidential award from both Presidents Reagan and Bush in the White House Rose Garden. Grice mentored dozens of community leaders across the Inland Empire until her death on New Year's Eve 2017 at the age of 84. Francis always was. Frances was an icon in this community. Well, everybody met Frances when Frances came to town. I mean, she came from the Motown town, you know? She came right in, uh, you know, like dynamite. She started going to all the organizations. She started talking about where she was from and some of the things that she wanted to do. And so she got involved right away. I met Frances Grice through Keith Lee. Keith Lee was the uh, county administrative officer over economic development. And um, he was a student of Frances's Operation Second Chance. And um, you know, he looked at what I was doing with Youth Action Project. He said, you know, you need to meet this woman named Frances Grice. And um, went over to her office off of Hospitality Lane, and it was history ever since. Dorothy Height wrote a grant um, in the early 80s through the National Council of Negro Women. And so I became the director of the one in San Bernardino. And so my first day of getting the contract here, I was with a contract in my hand and didn't know what to do. Well, Francis had already been there and done that, right? 
And so I was looking for a place to have an office and I went to this building downtown and she sent her staff, uh, she sent two or three other people to talk to the owner to make sure I got an office. She gave me my first set of furniture. She gave me reams of paper. That was just the kind of person she was. When I came to live in San Bernardino proper in the 1980s, that's when I would have seen this beautiful woman with this stark green eyes who had a presence about herself and spoke very comfortably and was not afraid to speak her mind about anything. That's when I probably in my brain said, that is the lady <laughs> that I have been hearing about all of these years. They don't know we had to dodge bullets. They don't know that the Ku Klux Klan was walking down E Street. They don't know that Harry Rubottom had to sue beans to get in a restaurant to eat a Chinese food. They don't know all the conditions that we had to go through. They don't know that our children had to develop a program to run into a room that we say, if, the, if they started to riot, we'd have to tell our kids, run in a room and lock the door and stay there. When she came to San Bernardino, she just um, heard the voices of the mothers that really felt like their kids weren't getting the best. And so she just felt like she was gonna do something about it. And so she organized a group of mothers and then they eventually became the League of uh, Mothers. While she was doing this fight for integration, there was some negotiations going on between the school district and the community. One of the issues was busing. They had taken the buses away from the children who lived on the west side of town. So if they wanted to go to school across town, they had to walk. The League of Mothers gave them holy hell over it. And as a result, the district gave back the busing opportunity. So Frances' involvement in desegregation was because she wanted to make sure that all kids had access to a quality education. She knew African-American young people needed to be trained. She knew that there was funding available. And I think that was her whole drive to start that training program. My sister found that being a part of Operation Second Chance gave her, equipped her with a particular skill that would help her in her adult life. When I was an assembly member, I was in Sacramento, and here's this young man walking into my office, and uh, he was president of the NAACP in Stockton, and he was working for this big company and all that. And I said, don't I know you from somewhere? He said, oh yeah, you remember me in San Bernardino. I went to Francis's training program. So anywhere you went, pretty much, you could run into somebody who was successful, who had been from San Bernardino and had gone through Francis's program. She has a great deal of responsibility for me being in the positions that I am today just because of her advice, um, her direction, and the ideas that she shared with me. We owe a lot to Francis Grice for that visionary thinking that she had and honoring that visionary thinking. She could pick up on what needed to be done and go ahead and start doing it. When she talked to you, it was like she was talking to your soul. Like literally, she can motivate you. Um, she could, uh, you know, make you want to fall out on the ground because you're not doing enough and then pick you back up and put you all back together again and help you get the direction that you needed. She was an amazing, amazing person. And she won't soon be forgotten. Continue to speak continue to defend, continue to work in the community, that would be the greatest legacy that she could have. Every day that I wake up is an opportunity for me to do better than I did the day before. And I think that's the message to young people. And we use Francis as a model. And if we as aspire to be, you know, the best selves, then, you know, there, I don't think there's anything that we can't do. We are women of faith. Uh, and that faith uh, energizes us to move those mountains. And right now, nobody in this community remembers, nobody even remembers a Francis Grice sometimes, 
very few people are here now that was here in the 60s and the 70s. So they know, don't know the struggle we had. Frances, much like Rosa and Dolores, was placed in a situation where she had to make a choice. Accept the problem or take it on. It can be argued that if Rosa hadn't given up her seat, or if Dolores had never led a protest, or if Frances had allowed schools to remain segregated, the world would be a very different place. Thankfully, they didn't. Their legacies reveal the personal power that we all possess to make a difference. And thus are true role models for courage in the face of injustice. We hope that you've been both inspired and enlightened. For the Empire Network PBS, I'm Iris Hill. And I'm Jessica Greenwell. Thanks for watching. you had an opportunity to learn something because again being sensitive to who women are is very important we're going to end our broadcast shall we say our time together with coffee with curry by taking a trip to michelle obama who was the first woman for the united states of america being born uh not of a privileged family but a family that was very much not known she did a phenomenal job of going to college and doing very well could have made much more money but she wanted to give back to her community where she met her husband and together they did some tremendous things here's michelle obama talking about women's history thank you so much Woo. hey <laughs> you guys good all right, rest yourselves. We got a lot to do. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here with all of you on this International Women's Day as we mark the first anniversary of Let Girls Learn. And today, we want to celebrate all of the wonderful progress we've made and the momentum we're seeing around girls' education across the globe. But before we get started, I, I just wanted to briefly express my sadness over the passing of former First Lady Nancy Reagan. Mrs. Reagan was a, a woman of incredible strength and grace, and she was a passionate advocate for so many important issues. Uh, through the example she set both during her time in the White House and beyond, Mrs. Reagan reminded us of the importance of women's leadership at every level of our society. And on a personal note, Mrs. Reagan also understood the value of mentoring. She warmly and willingly offered advice and encouragement to me as I settled in into my role as First Lady. And I am so grateful for her kindness and generosity to me and my family over the years. And I hope that our continued work to educate girls worldwide is a fitting tribute to her legacy. So. So back to the business at hand, I have to start by thanking Ambassador Power. Uh, another strong woman leader, as you heard, uh, for that wonderful, kind, generous introduction, but more importantly, for her extraordinary work to promote human dignity, human rights across the globe. We are lucky to have someone like her in this administration, and the President and I are <laughs> very lucky to have her as a friend. So. I also want to recognize our outstanding ambassador for global women's issues, Kathy Russell, and her yes, and her entire team at the State Department for hosting this event and for their tremendous work on girls' education and so many other critical issues. I'm thankful to have them as partners in this effort. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for your tremendous leadership on behalf of girls around the world. Some of you have been with us since the day we launched Let Girls Learn. Some of you have been working on girls' education for decades. And some of you are students who will be leading the way on this issue in years to come. And I'm so proud that you all are here. Give yourselves a round of applause. 
our young people. <clears throat> and I know that each of us here today has a story uh, like Samantha shared about how we first got engaged in this issue. The moment our heart first broke or we felt that first flare of outrage when we realized that 62 million girls worldwide, girls who are just as smart and hardworking as we are, aren't getting the opportunities that we sometimes take for granted. For me, it was the drumbeat of horrifying stories. Malala Yousafzai shot in the head by terrorists just for speaking the simple truth that girls should go to school. More than 200 Nigerian girls kidnapped from their school dormitory by a terrorist group determined to keep them from getting an education. Grown men trying to snuff out the aspirations of young girls. Little girls being brutally assaulted on their way to school, being forced to marry and bear children when they're barely even teenagers. Girls in every corner of the globe facing grave danger simply because they were full and equal human beings. That's what they decided, worthy of developing their boundless potential. And the more I traveled and met with girls and learned from experts about this issue, the more I realized that the barriers to girls' education isn't just resources. It's not just about access to scholarships or transportation or school bathrooms. It's also about attitudes and beliefs. The belief that girls simply aren't worthy of an education. That women should have no role outside the home that their bodies aren't their own, their minds don't really matter, and their voices simply shouldn't be heard. And like many of you, as a woman, I take all of this personally. While I, I'm thankful that I've never faced anything like the horrors that many of these girls endure, like most women, I know how it feels to be overlooked, to be underestimated. <laughs> to have someone only half listen to your ideas at a meeting, <laughs> to see them turn to the man next to you, the man you supervise, and assume he's in charge, or this, to experience those, those whistles and taunts as you walk down the street. And I've seen how these issues play out, not just on a personal level, but on a national level in our laws and policies. You see, in my lifetime, and I'm not that old, <laughs> it was perfectly legal for employers to discriminate against women. In my lifetime, women were not legally allowed to make fundamental decisions about their bodies. And practically speaking, many still can't. In my lifetime, domestic violence was seen as a private matter between a man and his wife, rather than as the horrific crime that it is. And today, it is so easy to take for granted all the progress we've made on these kinds of issues. But the fact is that right now, today, so many of these rights are under threat from all sides, always at risk of being rolled back if we let our guard down for a single minute. These issues aren't settled. These freedoms that we take for granted aren't guaranteed in stone. And they certainly didn't just come down to us as a gift from the heavens. No, these rights were secured through long, hard battles waged by women and men who marched and protested and made their voices heard in courtrooms and boardrooms and voting booths and the halls of Congress. And make no mistake about it, education was central to every last one of those efforts. The ability to read, write, and analyze, the confidence to stand up and demand justice and equality, the qualifications and connections to get your foot in that door and take your seat at the table, all of that starts with education. And trust me, girls around the world, they understand this. 
They feel it in their bones and they will do whatever it takes to get that education. I've seen it time and time again, girls in Senegal studying at rickety desks in bare concrete classrooms, raising their hands so hard that they're almost falling out of their chairs. Girls in Cambodia who wake up hours before dawn, ride their bikes for miles just to get to school. Bangladeshi immigrant girls in the United Kingdom who study for hours every night and proudly wear their hair, headscarves everywhere they go, resolutely ignoring those who would demean their religion. These girls risk everything. The rejection of their communities, the violation of their bodies, everything just to go to school each day. <laughs> and then here I show up <laughs> with a horde of international reporters shoving microphones in their faces. These girls don't blink. <laughs> They stand up, they look straight into those cameras, and they proudly explain who they want to be. Doctors and teachers, forces for change in their countries. You see, they know that education is their only path to self-sufficiency. It is their only chance to shape their own fate rather than having the limits of their lives dictated to them by others. And I'm passionate about this because I truly see myself in these girls, in their hunger, in their burning determination to rise above their circumstances and reach for something more. And I know that many of you do too. And let's be clear, this issue isn't just personal to women. I have met countless men who learn about the plight of girls around the world and they look into the eyes of their daughters and wives and mothers, women they deeply respect and love, and this issue becomes personal for them too. So it's not surprising that over the past year since we launched Let Girls Learn, we have been overwhelmed by the response we've received. This issue is truly resonating as folks in every sector are stepping up to take action on behalf of these girls around the world. From day one, the U.S. government has been leading the way with state, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, Corporation investing hundreds of millions of dollars. They're providing scholarships for girls in Liberia and the D Democratic Republic of Congo. They're doing leadership training for girls in Afghanistan. They're building school bathrooms for girls in El Salvador. They're taking on female genital mutilation in Guinea, forced child marriage in Bangladesh. Let Girls Learn also has a strong partner in the American Peace Corps. Volunteers are now running more than 100 girls education projects in 22 countries girls' mentorship programs, girls' leadership camps, and so much more. And through Let Girls Learn, dozens of major companies and organizations have come forward to support this work, including Lyft, JetBlue, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Starwood Hotels, I could go on and on, Alex and Ani, I've got my bracelets on. <laughs> They're donating hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're creating new products, backpacks, and charm bracelets, and t-shirts to raise money and awareness. They're promoting Let Girls Learn in their advertisements, their in-flight magazines, their hotel room videos. They're doing it all. The Girl Scouts are getting in on the action as well by creating a global action badge that girls can earn by learning about girls' education. And it's not just corporations and organizations who are getting engaged on this issue. Folks of all ages and all walks of life are stepping up as well. More than 1,600 people in nearly all 50 states have donated money to Let Girls Learn Peace Corps projects. Our 62 million girls hashtag was the number one hashtag in the U.S. with people across the country talking about the power of education. And we'll be launching the next phase of the social media campaign next week at South by Southwest. 
And we haven't just inspired folks here in the United States. Our hashtag was the number three hashtag globally, with girls around the world tweeting their support for Let Girls Learn. And countries like Japan, the UK, South Korea have joined this effort as well, investing more than half a billion dollars in girls' education. And at this year's UN General Assembly, nearly 200 countries agreed to make adolescent girls' education a top priority in the new global goals. And today, just 12 months after we launched Let Girls Learn, we're seeing the impact of these efforts all around the world. We see it in the story of a girl named Ficker from Ethiopia, who at the age of 13 found out that her parents were planning to marry her off to a man she'd never met. But Ficker had learned about the dangers of early ma marriage from a USAID program she was involved in. So she refused to go through with the marriage. She went on to graduate first in her entire sixth grade class. We see the impact of our work in the story of a young woman named Norhan in Egypt. When Norhan got accepted to a girls' science and technology boarding school supported by USAID, of course she was hesitant to leave home. But she took the plunge. And today, she's an avid coder. And when speaking about her plans for the future, she says, she says, I dream of being the youngest Nobel Prize winner for nuclear physics. And we're seeing the impact of our efforts, not just on girls worldwide, but on young people right here at home. Kids across the US are learning about these girls and they're embracing this issue as their own. Students at a middle school in California raised $1,500 for Let Girls Learn by selling popsicles and hot chocolate. At a school in Wisconsin, students raised $594 from their friends and families. As part of their campaign, they created signs to raise awareness, and one of the signs said that 33 million fewer girls than boys are in primary school worldwide. They said, we're in this together. Together, we can make a difference. See, even young kids get it. We're in this together because these girls are our girls. They are us. They each have the spark of something extraordinary inside of them, just like our daughters and our sons. And their fate is very much our responsibility. And in the coming months, we're going to be expanding our call to action to support these girls. We are going to be engaging even more people, moms and dads, faith and youth organizations, and young people like so many of you. Because there is so much that students like you can do to make a real difference on girls' education. You can study this issue and organize your classmates to take action. You can study or volunteer abroad and be on the front lines educating girls. After you graduate from college, you can even join the Peace Corps and run your own girls' education projects. Or if you get out there and get a job, like your parents may want you to, <laughs> you can get your company involved in Let Girls Learn. That's how Lyft got involved from one of our fellow young people who worked in this administration and now works at Lyft. That kind of commitment that companies are announcing today, you can be a part of making it happen. Every single one of us has a role to play on this issue. And you can start today by going to letgirlslearn.gov and find out how to get involved right now. No contribution is too small, as you can see, because in the end, that's how we're going to solve this problem. One girl, one school, one village at a time with folks like all of you, particularly our young people, leading the way. And no, it will not be easy. <laughs> and it will not be quick. But make no mistake about it, we can do this. If we can make this kind of project progress in just a year, in just a year, 
If we keep putting in this effort and this investment that these girls deserve, we can get this done. I know we are all up to the task. I know we are. I see it in your eyes. I know you feel that, that burning sensation, that sense of unfairness. Turn that into action. Turn that passion into something real. Those girls will be so grateful because they are all of us. They are my daughters and they are you. So I want to close by thanking all of you once again for everything, everything you have done in this year and everything we will continue to do together. And I do look forward to continuing our work together in the months and years to come. And I cannot wait to see all the doors we will open, all the fortunes we and futures we transform for girls across the globe. So you guys ready to get to work? You think we can get this done? All right, thank you all so much. God bless. <laughs>